I want to go to Luke, the first chapter, verses 32 through 34. Now, we were at a soccer tournament last weekend in Rapid City, and there's teams from all over. We were in one in July. We were one in here. We were... You know, and I was just uh, admiring all the people that come, and, and uh, there's other events, football events, and, and just uh, people coming out, and, and in some ways it's so good just to see families get together and see parents excited about their kids and loving their kids, and so it's all good. I really enjoy that, and I was just thinking about that, that <clears throat> uh, there's, there's always just a lot of issues trying to run an organization like that. Jody's been on the board, and, and it's just pressure, and it's just... You know, everybody's opinions and all that. It'd be very easy to give up on those things. And then I thought about, <laughs> you know, and some of them see us uh, grandparents there, and, and uh, uh, you know, and then there's a lot of grandparents that haven't got a clue what's going on. They're just there supporting and all that. But, <clears throat> but way back, uh, well, that doesn't matter, over 40 years ago, uh, my brother and I got into soccer when we got to Bible college and came back and started firing up everybody. We'd have f friends come out to our little farm and play with us out on the farm in the trees, and, and we've been playing ever since. And I got to think about it. Most people, when I show up, they don't know that I was president of the club once. I'm not even sure Jody knows that. No, I think she does. I think I told her enough times. But... <laughs> But, you know, and I just thought about those early days, and there's uh, there a man, man named Art Dackness that uh, worked it for me that was a real, uh, he and his boys were uh, some real foundation layers of pushing through when, when soccer wasn't even, you know, hardly known by anybody back then. And it's been very easy to give up, but we didn't, and we kept pressing on, and we tried to get lights in the field and couldn't get it done, and now they got them on. And I just look at all that, and I think, you know, there's a lot of people that won't, won't ever know who and why what they have right now is here. They don't know about the sacrifice that was made. You know, unfortunately, we won't get into it, but most people don't have, have any understanding of the sacrifice that was made for America to be birthed. My grandfather came from Norway, and he sold everything he had to come with hope, and his main reason was, uh, besides restlessness, was uh, religious freedom. And he was hungry for God, and he was hungry, and he came, but he was never really, you know, uh, he, he lived to be about 96, but he, uh, he lost two wives and had to raise two families by himself. And my grandfather talks about sometimes saying, Dad, can I go to bed without supper? Because he's so tired of eating salted pork <laughs> over and over. And so it wasn't like it was all grand. It wasn't like, you know, nowadays everybody's got so much stuff and nobody really knows the foundation fathers just and the people and the women and the children that laid such a high price out for us to have all the abundance that we have. So I was just thinking about that and uh, that there's just a bigger picture all the time going on. And then with Michael Bryan being gone, you know, in heaven, and I got to reflecting, you know, his, uh, his daughter did the last call on a recording. <laughs> that was brutal. Uh, Man, there's something about that. And uh, then uh, Ben got to play taps at the, at the grave site himself with his own trumpet. Man, that about the only thing he could do me bad worse is have a bagpipe there. We just about had that, didn't we, Deb? <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, I, and he's my age, so it's like I was just thinking about, man, I, you know, I actually could go. You know, I could have gone thousands of times already. But now that I've been here a long time, I kind of like staying. You know, I want to finish my race. I want to watch everybody grow in grace. And I was, I, uh, my swimming pool's got about an inch of ice on it now, and so I had to bust it and, and <laughs> get an opening in it last night to get down in it. Um, and uh, I didn't stay very long. Uh, it's about 30, 40 degrees. Uh, but I was thinking when I got, I got in there, I got... Wow, man, if I can, I went into, you know, a shock here. I, uh, uh, yeah, what a deal for Lisa to have to get up in the morning and find me frozen in the ice. I need to explain that to everybody. Just the reality that this is temporal, okay? This is temporal. This is a vapor for all of us. But then... 
uh, all the songs we sung today really fit. And But then to think that, God, you've been so good to me. You're so good to me. You let me exist. You've let me live. You've let me find truth. You've let me be filled with the Holy Ghost. You've let me be with a group of people that are hungry for God. I mean, we are so wealthy in the knowledge of God compared to so many people in the world today who have no knowledge. And so today I want to I want to talk and because how you and I our self talk and our our the images that are in us. We can call it our imagination, but it's our heart views things in pictures, not in, in words. It views it in videos. It views it in, in uh, uh, heartfelt feelings. And so uh, today, that's, I want to encourage you to take another look at Jesus. So I'm going to read to you out of Luke 1, verse 32. It says, <laughs> he's prophesying over uh, Mary, and he said, and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I'm a, a virgin? <laughs> I threw that last part in because it's like, here it is. The word is being spoke over about who Jesus is and who he was and who he will be forever. And this, and that's a, this it's called the gospel. It's an incredible story. And Mary says, well, yeah, but how can that be? <laughs> I'm a virgin. Now, that's an honest question, obviously, okay? But you think about that for a moment. Here's this master plan of God to save mankind, to create man in his own image and to have men and women be with him and live with him forever. And if we get this little snippet right here in this little place in, in the time in history, and these words are being said about all this truth, and, and Mary's saying, yeah, but I'm kind of confused about my little life here. How does it fit? And I thought, wow, isn't that true for all of us? God, you've got a master plan, but how does my little life, how does it fit for me? How are we going to do this? <clears throat> and I think one of the things that really pays off in our life is to stop and meditate and just say, wow, this thing is way bigger than me, right? It's way, you know, Andrew's got a little book out, and I used to hand a lot of them out. Um, I'm trying to think of the name. Um, hmm, can't come up with it. It's something like... Uh, the root of grief is self-centeredness. And being discouraged, being down, being out, being uh, hopeless really boils down, he said, to uh, in this little booklet. It just really always comes down to self-centeredness. Well, I, he's got a lot of flack for saying it, and I get a lot of flack when I hand it to people. I, I hand it to people and said, read that, and they read it, and I call them up. Hey, you ought to go. I said, I hate it. I didn't like it at all. And I understand that. At the same time, if we can step back out of our little world and out of our little time zone that we live in and see the bigger picture and just say, wow, this is one big story, isn't it? Jesus, he's really something, isn't he? He was there in the beginning. He was the word. He came in a physical body at the right time. And then he died. And then the Spirit of God raised him up. And where is he now? And what is he doing now? And I appreciate my friend Guy Dunnick. He's the one that emphasizes this. But uh, we'll get to it. But Jesus has a ministry today. He has a ministry today. And it's an excellent ministry, the Bible says. So I've got 21 scriptures here <laughs> that I'm going to ask Chad to read, because if I start reading them, I'm going to be talking about every one of them, and we won't get out till 2. Uh, so I'm going to ask Chad to come and read these. And <clears throat> I think I've shared this about a year ago, but of all the prophecies that were uh, recorded in the Old Testament, and then 
mentioned in the New Testament. One of them, I think, is I think it's five or six times. It's the one that's mentioned the most. He's talking about Jesus being at the right hand of God and waiting for all his enemies to be put underneath his footstool. And so when, when you, as you listen to these scriptures, and I guess part of it, I, you know, a lot of times we try to you know, have two or three scriptures that make a point, but I, I wanted you to hear all these. They're all in the New Testament, and they're all saying basically the same thing about Jesus and where he is now and, and uh, his position. And as Chad reads them, don't worry about if you, uh, you know, where they came from. Chad, I don't care if you even read the scripture references. You can if you want to. But this is said so many times in the New Testament that, it, you know, when Jesus said something, you know, in that time, if you repeated yourself twice, it was like, pay attention. Some of your parents do that, right? And, and if you said, verily, 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 three times, I mean, it's like, man, you better listen up or you're going to be in big trouble. Three times, and I want you to just catch how, how often these scriptures, this thought is said throughout the New Testament. And then I also want you to just really uh, allow yourself to, um, if you want to shut your eyes, you can, or if you don't, but just really do all that you can to visualize your Jesus today and where he's at. All right, Chad, you can skip Luke and go. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take the suggestion, right? maybe not read all the references here. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. David himself said in the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So then when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand. Let's see, where am I? Yeah, no, there's something else. Okay, never mind. Something got cut off. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels. 
and as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily administering and offering time after time the same until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him? When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Thank you, Chad. That's a lot of them, isn't there? And where is he? Right hand. And, uh, <clears throat> and by the way, when you look at him, which side of the father is he on? It was kind of funny, about 40 years ago, I was meditating on this, and I had him on the other right hand. You know, I'd be looking at the father, and I had him on that side. So if you're looking at me, I had him over here. But this is my right hand, <laughs> right? And so I had to flip that around. So about, it's kind of humorous, but about every time I read these, I go, I'll make sure you get him on the right side. That's where he's seated. And isn't it interesting, when they're killing Stephen and, and he, he began to leave his body, he said to open up the, the heavens, and he looked up and he said, I saw him in all his glory at the right hand of the Father. I imagine there's quite a few others that when they depart from this earth, that before they leave, they probably get to see him seated, seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, Stephen saw him standing there, which is interesting because sometimes I just think every once in a while Jesus stands to see what's going on. There's so many, there's so many things to be said here, but in Hebrews there it said, fixing your eyes on Jesus. So one of the things we know of to get through our problems in life and to, to find our way and our path in life and, and to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God, one of the things we got to do is keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. But to do that, you need, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a show, I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen it, but uh, they make fun of, of saying, I want to pray to baby Jesus, not to the big Jesus. You know, and the point is, is if you're going to fix your eyes on Jesus, what are you seeing? What have you fixed your eyes on? What, what do you see when you try to, to see Jesus? Uh, because... How you view him and how you perceive him is going to be absolutely determined how, how you walk out your daily life. You know, as a young boy, I saw my dad as, as pretty smart and pretty wise and pretty strong. And I remember, I think we were on like a Ferris wheel or something. I know there's a story about that, but we, my, my, I don't, I'm, we didn't hold hands a lot, Dad and I. <laughs> we worked hand in hand. But I do remember as a child being scared about something and reaching over, and Dad grabbed my hand. My perception of him was, he's with me, I'll be okay. It's kind of interesting as time went on, Dad and I held hands a lot more in the last three years of his life. Often I'd have to grab his hand and help him out of his chair and up the stairs in a bad situation. 
And every time I did and felt the warmth of his hands, and by the time he was 97, 98, 99, 100, his little hands were a lot softer than back when we were kids. They were still firm, but not as firm as they used to be. And now he was grabbing my hand because for me to have strength to take care of him. Think about this. When you fix your eyes on Jesus, what is your perception of how strong he is? How much he loves you? How much he's involved in what you're doing? Because it'll, it'll, it will start flipping all the other emotions and feelings in your heart and in your mind and your anxiety if you can see Jesus as he truly is. He is seated at the right hand of God, which is a symbol of the power. And you know how many times it said power in there too? Seated at the right hand of power. He did all that he did. He rose from the dead. He's all powerful. All things have been laid out to him. All things have been given to him. All principalities and powers bow to him. And, and the father said to him, now you sit here. Now this is really interesting to me. Jesus, you sit here, right here beside me in my right hand, until something happens. I know this kind of will blow some of your end time thinking out, but he said, you sit there until what? All the enemies are underneath your feet. So if he's the head and we're the body, where's the feet? Here. So I don't know what you're going to do with that, but to me, I'm, I'm saying Jesus is going to sit there until all his enemies are underneath his feet, underneath us. And then the Father says, Jesus, stand. Blow the trumpet. Go get your family. Until that happens, the plan of God is going to be executed. There may be bumps in the road, there may be tragedies, there may be whatever, but I'm telling you, the plan is by the Heavenly Father that Jesus will be at his right hand until all his enemies are underneath his feet, and then he'll finish this thing. That's our brother. That's our Savior. That's our healer. That's our best friend. That's the one who sent his own spirit to come into us until what? Until we defeat every enemy underneath our feet. They may blow some of theories and some religion, but listen, I'm telling you, just like I was talking earlier, the, the soccer organization, there's been up and downs and people that gave up and, and uh, everything else, but overall now, it continues to go on. God's plan was for Jesus to come, and once he rose from the dead, his kingdom, would, he's, gonna, he's reigning right now, and he's reigning in power, and there'll be no end to it. It's kind of interesting just to think about the no end part because it's the same as eternity. It's the same as having no beginning and having no end. In other words, it's interesting for me to listen to the scientists and stuff and say that our, our universe, we have uh, billions of stars in our universe in the Milky Way galaxy, and then we have billions of galaxies out there, which, which is uh, crazy. And, and, they're in, and everything's expanding and increasing. And, and to think, you know, that's awful big. <laughs> I mean, if you really ever look at it, it's just, you, it's just so massive. Especially when you look at how big the earth is, and it's, a little, it's, not even a, you know, it's not even a little pencil dot. You can't even find it in the midst of our Milky Way, let alone the billions of galaxies. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. And they're increasing. And I just think, here's the beautiful thing. Jesus' kingdom will have no end. It is non-stop growing and so uh, people can say oh everything's falling apart and it's the worst it's ever been and it's uh, the, the world is just you know gone nuts and everything and the, and the truth is that's not true at all right now is the greatest time of God's kingdom since his resurrection 
Well, how do you say that, John? Because he said it would not end. It would not, it would not slow down. It would, it would only increase. It would not back up. It would not get smaller. It would only get bigger and bigger. And so in some ways, I think it's, it can comfort you and it can empower you. It can even flip your whole life and change everything about you when you go, oh, my gosh, I, I'm, a, I'm a part of this, but I'm a part of something way bigger than my little life. Mary's concern about, I'm a virgin, how am I going to have a child? It was, you know, it was all taken care of. And it's like, oh, uh, man, I'm, uh, I'm this, I'm that. Uh, uh, I've been diagnosed with this or whatever else. What am I going to do? It's a small little part, but his kingdom is increasing. And when you fix your eyes on that, I believe it takes care of all the natural temporal problems that we have. I believe it empowers us then to rise up. You know, we tell this story, but uh, um, the ultimate gift, who wrote that? Jim? Jim Stovall. Jim Stovall was a pro football player, whatever else, went blind, and then he started writing books, and then he made a movie out of that. You don't know, it's a great history. He's a great man of God, or a good man of God. <laughs> great. But uh, Elaine Shuck is not here today, but she became good friends with him, and, and uh, he was telling about a lady that – that uh, was, uh, had divorced her husband, uh, had kids, and then she got diagnosed with cancer, and she was about 45, and she was dying in the hospital of cancer. It was really bad. And, and I think she, they, she wanted Jim to be the godfather or whatever, the children and, and all that, and she was dying. And then, but, so her kids were going to go to the, her ex-husband. Well, he ends up being killed in a car wreck. You know, son, her children had nobody other than Jim. And he just said, she heard that, and she just, she got up. She was in the hospital waiting to die. She got up, asked him to take all the tubes off and everything else, and she walked out, and she says, if he's gone, I got to stay. And she walked out and took care of her kids and was healed. That's just a true story. And you think, I, I can tell you more stories like that when people all of a sudden just say, I can't go. I have to remain. Is that not the story that Paul said? He told the Philippians, he says, I am just distraught. I'm just, I'm just really messed up. I'm just really struggling with this. And he, he tells him what it was. He says, I want to go home to be with Jesus. But it'd be better if I stayed for you. And at the end, he says, I've made my decision. I'm staying. And people say, well, you know, that's a decision we don't get to make. Well, I don't know. Paul made it. I can tell you thousands, not a thousand, but dozens of stories of men who knew when they are going to go and decided when they are going to go, and women. Here's what I'm trying to say. Was when, you, when you fix your eyes on Jesus and you see him at the right hand of the Father, all-powerful, almighty, waiting for his enemies to be put underneath his feet, and you say, wow, that's the plan. That's what's happening. That's what our Heavenly Father's. That is what is going to happen. It doesn't matter how much junk is in between. And I'm a part of that. I'm in Christ. He's in me. I'm a part of that. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this little thing about being a virgin and having a son is not a big deal. This little deal about what I'm in is not a big deal. I'm part of something way bigger than my little life, and I'm going to live forever with him, and that's my big brother, and that's the one that saved me, and that's the one that said I'll never die, and that's the one that said I'll never taste death, and he's the one that said go out there and defeat. He's the one that said I give you my name, which is above every name, cast out the devil, heal the sick, and raise the dead. And when you see that bigger picture, all of a sudden this temporal world with all its problems and all its issues just go, Oh, it ain't that big a deal. Amen? I mean, I really believe we'll see more demonstration and more victories if we will fix, do what the Bible says, fix our eyes on Jesus. And remember, it's not, you know, he's seated at the right hand. In other words, he's waiting for somebody else. And we're, you know, sometimes well, I'm waiting on Jesus. He's waiting on you. He's up there observing. Because Why? Because he did everything once and for all for you and I to be empowered to do everything we need to do. 
He's not withhold. God, the Bible says he's not withhold one good thing. He didn't withhold Jesus. He's not going to withhold one thing. What's, what's the difference? That's our perspective, our, our persuasion, our faith, how we see it and how we believe it. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it's there. I'm just saying it's what we're supposed to do. I'm just saying it's, it's, it's possible. It's not impossible. It's possible to actually believe in this one who was in the beginning and has never changed. And then to see him. Can you imagine if you sacrificed everything to, to help somebody? Wouldn't you want, you know, if you really laid everything down to help your kids, wouldn't you want them to pick up what you laid down before them and run with it? If you've ever sacrificed to buy a gift for somebody, and, and you know, I, I bought this gift for somebody. It was really kind of special. It came from Israel, and, I, and uh, it was really special to me, and it had uh, a coin in it that was, uh, you know, from 70 A.D. It was, it was really awesome, and I felt led from the Lord to give it to somebody. I gave it to them. They go, oh, thanks. And I, I just all but said, <clears throat> I, oh, wait a minute. Why don't you give that back to me? I got another one for you. Because you don't value that. You're going to set that on your shelf. You're going to probably forget even where it came from. I can't tell you how many times even now saying it. I kind of want to go check on it and see if I can get it back. <laughs> if you've ever thought, well, I wonder if God just thinks I want too much in life. I must, I tell you this. If, well, think about it this way. Jesus, after all that, you think he wants you to put it on the shelf, his power, his glory, his spirit? Or do you think you'd really be honored if you said, man, I'm going to take what you've given me and run my race. Everything I've got, I'm going to go after it with everything I've got. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to believe it. I, I, I think Jesus would be way more honored with that. Let me read you this last scripture, Hebrews 8. says this. Now, the main point is what has been, in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of, of the majesty in the heavens. A minister, that's our Jesus. He's a minister in the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both sacrifices and gifts, and so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on, on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy, a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect a, tam, a tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you, on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. Isn't that awesome? Jesus has obtained, he has a hold of right now, a more excellent ministry. By as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted, enacted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with, <clears throat> with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them out by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant and did not care for them. And I did not care for them, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them in their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant... He has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. This new covenant is what we live in. In this new covenant, the beautiful thing is, he said, I will write my laws, my precepts, my... my uh, uh, you know, when you think of laws, you only just think about don't do this, don't speed and all that. 
But that's not what I was really talking. I was talking about the laws that govern everything, the go- the laws that <clears throat> that it's his character, his viewpoint, his glory. He says, "I'm going to put it in their hearts." Before we had to just read these things and try to do it on our best ability, and we never could do it. He says, "Now we're going to do away with that. Totally do away with that. Okay, that covenant's gone. I don't know how many people are trying to get the old Jewish covenants back." Yeah, even Christians are trying to start doing some of the old Jewish stuff again. It's like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? This isn't about going back to the old covenant. That's done. It's done away with. It's dead. There's a new one here. And this new one is he literally takes the truth that he knows, the power that he has, and all the way that, that things function. He knows everything, and he says, I'm going to put it in your heart and in your mind. Man, it is. You know why we miss it? Because we just don't believe it. We're still striving to grab something or whatever else instead of looking right here and saying, this big brother of mine, Jesus, he, he defeated all. He, he wiped out Satan. He, he rose from the dead, and now he's seated because he's all finished with what he had to do, and now he's just waiting for me to rise up and put enemies underneath my feet. And he's given me everything naturally in my heart. You know how many people I talk to that say, well, I'm truly trying to hear God. Why are you trying to hear God? Well, I thought we were supposed to. Well, yeah, but you're, what do you mean trying? It's, how, how can we say that? It's not your effort that's going to make it work. It's you believing it. I mean, there's times I get up and I mean, so often I get up in the morning and say, God, what do you want me to do? And he says, I'll show you the way. I'll show you the, as the day goes by. Oh, can I trust you? Do you know what you're doing? Are you too busy to talk to me? Are you, you know? Because a lot of times our whole attitude is, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what God's saying. And it's like, man, that, that's just a re- you're just revealing you. What you, what, you're revealing what you're seeing. Fix your eyes on Jesus. This is his game. This is his, his will. This is his plan, not yours. You're not presenting anything to him for approval. He is saying, this is my kingdom. You're in it if you want to be in it. And when you come into it, I'm going to empower you, and I'm going to instruct you, and I'm going to show you the way. Just trust me and keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. Isn't it interesting that Peter, when he walked on the water, he began to sink. I don't know how you begin to sink. When I sink, I sink. (laughs) I'm in the bottom. He began to sink. Because why? Because he heard the wind. Okay, how many of you can walk on wind, on water as long as it's not windy? No logic there, is there? And he saw the waves. Okay, so if there's no waves and there's no wind, anybody could walk on water. You can if you got your eyes fixed on Jesus. If you know who he is. You know what the game plan is. You know how powerful he is. He's seated at the right hand of power. You know, let me just throw this out. But I think that's why Anders had the boldness to say, when you're all discouraged, it's because you took your eyes off Jesus and you got your eyes back on yourself. Well, what about my little life? Well, what's going to happen to me? And I'm not trying to make fun of it, but I'm trying to make fun of it. Man, you might as well mock your flesh. Because he'll take you down a road you don't want to go. You might as well mock your old man. Because, I mean, I got an old man, you got an old man. I don't think they call it old woman. But uh, probably be disrespectful. But you got one. But when you fix your eyes on Jesus, it's like... Oh, man, it's, it is good. And if this thing will never end, 
And yeah, I got a short period to be down here. If I die today, I'm all right. I'll never taste death. I'll just move out of here. Man, do you see how much peace we could have, how much joy, how much power we could have if we fix our eyes on Jesus and we see the right, see the Jesus, not a baby Jesus, not a Jesus on the cross anymore, but the one who is seated at the right hand of the power is, is a, nothing's going to stop this kingdom. What Jody just said, there's nothing going to stop this kingdom. This kingdom is not being hammered on right now. This kingdom is overtaking darkness. We are overtaking darkness in the world right now in a greater way. You're just hearing the enemy's report. You and I are hearing the enemy's report trying to, trying to do. Let's go one last scripture. I'm uh, sorry. Not sorry. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 11. We shared this last week. Second Corinthians 11. Three. Paul said this. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. That's where all this message came from. Keep it real simple. He's imparted everything into your heart and into your mind. Trust him on that. Believe him. And keep your eyes fixed on that. And everything else we can walk right through. Father, I thank you for this day. <clears throat> I thank you for your joy that you give us. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we're a part of something so big and so wonderful for all eternity. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're helping us. It's not impossible. It's not some dream. It's a reality that we right here in this room and those listening to me can fix our eyes on Jesus. And see him seated at your right hand, Father. Man, I tell you, I can feel your, your joy when we declare these things out of our mouth. I can see your, your, your passion, Father, that you have children that are rising up, taking what your son paid for and delivered to us by the Spirit of God coming inside of us and defeating the enemy. And this will never stop. Never stop increasing forever and ever. So as we look at this, we see all the loved ones and the saints that have gone before us, Paul and Peter and our, and our grandparents and our loved ones that have gone before are with you. And we see that it's not just, you know, someplace off in the blue. It's all the reality of the kingdom of God. And we see our own place here on earth now to shine, as Jody said. It is our time to shine. It is our time to show forth the glory of God onto this earth by walking victoriously and declaring the truth. And then we are forever going to be with you in this mass family of your kingdom. I believe, these people believe, and we're fixing our eyes on you, Jesus. And we tell all our enemies, get under our feet now. That's where you belong. And that's where you remain. So be it. Amen. Amen. Man, have an awesome week.
fixed on Jesus and just knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that the bigger plan can't you cannot you are not big enough to stop what God wants to do and he wants you saved healed delivered set free empowered and victorious hallelujah that's our Jesus amen amen God bless you again